All right. So there's a lot of passages, as you said before, regarding the millennial reign of Christ. And um, again, you know, I love the Bible. So can I can I put something on the screen and read it? Are you okay with that? Like it's a whole chapter though. You know, look, thumbs up. You know, when, when I do my show, I, I'm the boss. So it's your, your, <laughs> your show. You do whatever you want. I'm with you. All right. So let me, I'll be bossy. I can be bossy. I'm good at that. Okay. Um, we'll make sure this looks okay because I have no idea. I think that's right. Okay. So can you see that? Yeah. All right. So this is in Zechariah 14. And I really love the layout of this whole entire chapter because I feel that it gives a layout of kind of what's going to happen. So it says here, and sorry guys, that, but I am going to read the Bible. Um, Behold, a day is coming for the Lord. Uh, yeah, hello, I can't read. Behold, a day is coming for the Lord when the spoil taken from you will be divided among you, for I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city will be captured and the houses plundered, the women ravished and a half of the city exiled. But the And I know I'm reading fast, but we'll go into this. But the rest of the people will not be cut off from the city. Then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as when he fights on a day of battle. In that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which is in front of Jerusalem on the east, which I'm sure you have seen that being there plenty of times, right? Um, and the Mount of Olives will be split in its middle from east to west by a very large valley. Um, so that half, I was just going to ask you a question, but let me finish reading. So that half of the mountain will be, uh, will move toward the north and the other half toward the south. You will flee by the valley of my mountains. For the valley of the mountains, you will reach to Azel. Correct me if I said that wrong. Uh, yes, you will flee just as you fled before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Then the Lord my God will come and the holy ones with him. In that day, they will, so in that day is talking about the millennial, right? Talking about the second coming. The second coming. So in that day, there will be no light. The luminaries will be dwindled. Yep, Matthew 24. Okay. For it will be a unique a unique day, which is known to the Lord, neither day or night, nor night, but it will come about at evening time, there will be light. So that verse there, I get kind of stuck on verse seven. So actually, let me write that down. Um, and in that day, living waters will flow out of Jerusalem, half of them towards the Eastern Sea and the other half toward the Western Sea. It will be in summer as well as in winter, and the Lord will be king over all the earth in that day. The Lord will be the only one and his name the only one. I'll give that a big old hallelujah. All the land will be changed into... Oh, I know, I'm going to butcher these names. Into a plain from... I want to say Reba because Giba. I don't know. How do you say that? Geba. Geba. Okay. I was just thinking Reba McIntyre there. I don't have no idea. <laughs> to Ramon. <laughs> How do oh, you yeah, say that? Good. Is that right? Yep. Okay. But I'm sure it's not said Hispanically. Uh, south of Jerusalem, but Jerusalem will rise and remain on its site from Benjamin's gate as far as the place of the first gate to the corner gate and from the tower of Hananel. Thank you. I would never even attempt to say that word. To the king's wine presses. People will live in it and there will be no longer, there will no longer be a curse for Jerusalem will dwell in security. Now this will be the plague with which the Lord will strike all the people who have gone to war against Jerusalem. Their flesh will rot while they stand on their feet and their eyes will rot in their sockets, and their tongue will rot in their mouths. That just sounds so disgusting. It will come about in that day that a great panic from the Lord will fall on them, and they will seize one another's hand, and the hand of one will be lifted against the hand of another. Judah also will fight at Jerusalem, and the wealth of all the surrounding nations will be gathered, gold and silver and garments in great abundance. So also like this plague will be the plague on the horse, the mule, the camel, the donkey, and all the cattle that will be in those camps. Then it will come about... <clears throat> That any who are left of all the nations that went against Jerusalem will go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to celebrate the Feast of Booths, which is also the Feast of Tabernacles, correct? Mm -hmm. And it will be that whichever of the families of the earth does not go up to Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, there will be no rain on them. If the family of Egypt does not go up or enter, no, uh, then no rain will fall on them. It will be the plague with which the Lord smites the nations who do not go up to celebrate 
the Feast of Booths. This will be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all the nations who do not go up to celebrate the Feast of Booths. And I know there's a lot of information here. In that day, there will be inscribed on the bells of the horses, holy to the Lord, and the cooking pots in the Lord's house will be like the bowls before the altar. Every cooking pot in Jerusalem and Judea will be holy to the Lord of hosts, and all who sacrifice will come and take of them and boil in them. And there will no longer be a Canaanite in the house of the Lord of hosts in that day. Again, I know that's a lot to take in, but to me, there's a lot of information there. So help us break down that entire passage. No, I'm teasing. There's a lot of good nuggets in there. I know a lot of it at the end seems a little confusing. So kind of give us a time frame of that, because I feel like it's like beginning to end in all in one chapter, so, so to speak. What you have in in many of the Old Testament prophets, uh, for example, if you read Zechariah 9.9, uh, it's talking about Jesus coming on a donkey, and then it goes right into talking about his second coming. And so you don't know that. I mean, if mm-hmm. you were to read it, uh, you know, before Jesus came, let's say you read it in 300 BC, you wouldn't have any idea that there's a separation there. And so what he does uh, in Zechariah 14 does the same thing. It starts out, it starts out uh, describing the end of the tribulation where there's going to be this great war. God's going to gather all the nations. That's Armageddon. And it, then it talks about Jesus coming down and in that battling the, the, the nations uh, again, Armageddon. And then it switches back to describing some of the other millennial things, mm-hmm. but then it goes back and says, Oh, let's talk about the plague that's being put against these, these guys that are happening at Armageddon, which is their, their flesh is melting. And then it goes mm-hmm. back to the, the time in the millennium where if you don't, if the nations or the families of the, of the nations, Egypt, Mitzrayim in, in Hebrew is just a family. Uh, but if you don't go celebrate or send a delegation to Jerusalem for the feast of booths to celebrate, God's not going to send rain on you or any of the other nations. So it's jumping back and forth between Armageddon into the millennium back to Jesus to, uh, standing on the Mount of Olives at the second coming mm-hmm. and then back into the millennium. But there's, it's, it's so rich because you see that again, there is this feast of booths and you're like, well, if you were to ask an all millennial, all millennialist or a post millennialist, Hey guys, when is this prophecy going to happen? They'd say, no, it's, it's spiritual. It's figured. Mm. And then you'd say, well, okay, okay, tell me what it means. You, 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 you don't collaborate with each other. Mm-hmm. They're all going to come up with 10 different options. Right. Instead of just taking it straightforward, that it means what it means that during that millennial period, these are the things that are going to happen. It's interesting. There's several, there's a lot there. I mean, there's a lot to talk about as it relates to a thousand years, mm-hmm. but the, in the book of Micah and, and even Isaiah, it talks about that when Jesus uh, in Zechariah, when Jesus comes down and stands, it creates this valley that goes east to west. And so the front part of the north, the Mount of Olives is going to go and the, and the south part is going to go south. But then what you have in the millennial period is I tell people that, hey, if you if you can go to Israel today, you know, sometime before the Lord comes back, you need to do it. Now, you don't need to do it. You should do it. You could do it because on my bucket once, list when I win the right, lotto. Once the millennium happens, everything that we see in Jerusalem is gone. The, the entire topography has changed. Mm. All of a sudden, the biggest mountain in the world is going to be in Jerusalem, not yeah. Mount Everest. So everything is going to change. The 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 the, ge- the geography, the topography, everything is. You know, as you read it early about, there's going to be rivers coming down to the east and to the mm. west. Again, that's. That's part of the millennial millennial system where there's a temple there that's Ezekiel mm-hmm. 40 through 48 describes. And the temple complex is a mile square. It's huge on top of this mountain. It's amazing. So that photo that you sent me, is that that temple mm-hmm. that you just mentioned? So yeah. Sandra, so guys, I need, and I know I already said this, so let me digress real quick, but Sandra's really doing a lot outside of the norm here. So if she can just get some love along with the rest of my moderators, that would be great. And also the last time you were here, Mondo, I, you haven't seen, right? Oh, yeah, no, I chair. think you did. The new oh, chair. But let me let me just chair. tell you this. You, um, the last time you were here, I got a new chair. So I'm just wondering what's going to happen this time. Yeah, that's, that's what we were, we, we were, uh, people were going yes, for the chair. That's great. They were. So I felt like it was like seven years ago. Um, but anyway, so Sandra, did you want, you want me to do the overlay thumbs up? So I know. 
So you got it? Wait, she gave me a thumbs up. So how would you take that? So thumbs up, you're doing it or thumb there we go. Oh, there it is. Okay. okay. Um, so that so this is I don't know if everyone can see that. Hopefully they can. Um, so explain what we're looking at here. So this, uh, I want to give credit where credit's due. This is a chart from D uh, Arnold Fruchtenbaum's book, Footsteps of the Messiah. He's got a whole bunch of charts in there, which is fabulous. Mm -hmm. And so this chart <clears throat> is a description of, or uh, illustration, <coughs> excuse me, of Ezekiel 40 through 48. This, this temple that was uh, prophesied to be built uh, in the time, and it's never been built. It, it, it's, it's really impossible to be built. Uh, it's never been built in history. So again, how, when is Ezekiel 40 through 48, this promise, the scripture going to be fulfilled? Uh, the only way it's fulfilled is if you take it literal and it has to happen in a, in a, in a thousand year millennial situation on earth, because the eternal state's way different. Mm -hmm. So what you have here is you have the temple, you see there, uh, the temple, uh, this temple square, uh, is, is itself one mile. But then you have this 50 mile by 50 mile uh, uh, city that has the different areas. Uh, the temple there is a little black box in, mm -hmm. on the top. And then you see the, the water, the, the river coming out of it, and it flows down. It describes it. It goes to the east, and mm -hmm. then it goes south. And then when it gets down to the, the, the lower part of the – in the place of Levi – it then splits off and goes into the Dead Sea, which miraculously heals it. And the other part goes to the Mediterranean Sea. So right now, the way that the valley system is set up, uh, you have the Hindon Valley, you have the Kidron Valley there. There's no way it's possible to make this happen. So you have this, the entire area, this 50 square mile mountain, which is big, yeah. being put up there with the temple there. And of course, the priests are living there and other things. So it's, it's just, it's amazing. And it's going to be so awesome to be able to go there and to see Jesus's throne and to interact. And I, I hope we get a chance to talk about it, that, you know, we're going to rule and reign, reign with him. I mean, we're, we're the leaders during this time. It's awesome. That Yes, that is in my notes because that's very important because I like to be a leader. So I, that's like the perfect <laughs> position for me. No, I'm joking. So let me ask you something though, regarding this temple here. So being that you've been there and anyone else who's traveled to Israel and really i don't like any of you, but that's okay. Um, so with that being said, what are your, and really just has nothing, to, and I don't want to debate with anyone, so please, nothing in the comments. I'm just asking a simple question. Do you think a lot of, this is a divisive topic, so no other person than you because you're just very even keel. So the temple, when it is built, is it going to be on the Dome of the Rock, near the Dome of the Rock, somewhere different? What are your thoughts on that? You're talking about the third, the Tribulation mm -hmm. Temple. Yeah. Uh, no one can say definitively. Uh, what I've seen, I've actually seen the architectural plans, uh, long story there, because I'm trying to finish a book on the Red Heifers. And so uh, I was able to, to get some insight on that from the person that was there uh, at Ground Zero on it. But you have three different options that scholars will go back and forth on. One of them, which I'd reject how, right out of, is that it's going to be built on the south where the Al-Aqsa Mosque is. Uh, nope, I don't see that as being even viable. Um, there's another outlier option, which some people believe it'll be built down in the city of David. That's, at, that's where the original temple was. Uh, there's some people that believe in that. It's been around for a long time, but no... no no modern Israeli archaeologist would agree with that. But so now you have two options left, which I think are the, the legitimate viable options. And that is the Dome of the Rock or north of the Dome of the Rock in a place called the Dome of the Spirits, which uh, when I go there, I always take mm. people there like, hey, here you are. This is the, one of the other options. Mm -hmm. The plans that I saw uh, were certainly had in consideration that there was a wall like a 15, 20 foot wall built just, it was, it's an East West wall on the temple Mount built just North of the dome of the rock, which would separate and have then the temple being built on the North side of that. Cause it's really big up there. It's 35 acres. So, wow. So it's huge. And then it would be built over what we know as the dome of the spirits, uh, which would allow um, the, which would allow them to have both have a presence there. Now, so, I can't tell you. I don't know whether um, what's going to be the final thing. We also don't know the politics. I think it, it, when, you, when you're dealing with prophecy, 
there has to be a certain level of humility because mm. uh, you can't be dogmatic. What we see today, well, the Jews would never accept it. Well, the Jews would never accept that right now. Mm. But imagine, um, you know, all sorts of political or, or wars or um, desperation. I mean, we know that Israel is going to become so desperate, whether that's from Psalm 83, maybe that's Ezekiel 38. We don't know all the details, but but we know that they that wars are determined for them. Mm-hmm. Daniel 9 says that. So they can come to the point of becoming so desperate. And we saw that as it relates to them even becoming a nation, that when the first thing came in, in 1947, when the UN partitioned the land, they they said, OK, we're going to give you this little bit. And man, Israel said, yes, we'll take it. Mm. Where it was it was nothing compared to what they have today. But they were so desperate to be recognized mm. and to have peace. That's a good point. They, they took whatever they could get. Mm-hmm. Would that same ethos or mentality come to be again as, as it approaches towards the next wars that are coming with Iran and and and, and, uh, and Russia, et cetera, Hezbollah, Hamas? Could they come to the place where they get offered something and they say, you know what? It's better than nothing. Let's take it for the sake of peace. And may, maybe it's wrapped into the peace mm-hmm. deal. I mean, you know, we, we That's know what that I've thought. Mm-hmm. the covenant is there. And so it's, hey. Uh, we're all we'll sign the peace deal with all of our enemies and we get a temple. It's just a little bit north. It's still on the Temple Mount. I mean, again, right now we can't say one way or the other definitively. Yeah. So on that photo that we just looked at, um, I know Sandra took that down. So when we're looking at the, the temple, um, so I mean, give us give me because my brain is not always brilliant. Um, in America, like, give me a state or how big is this? Like, what is the, what is the, the, the dimensions oh, I mean, of this? No, like, how far good, does it go? I'm trying to think about that. It would probably be this particular, I mean, the temple you can see there is the temple itself is one mile. So the, the old city today, and I don't even, I don't even think if you were to walk in the old city, some people might not know what I even mean by that, but in the old city, you have the, the in the four quadrants and then you have the 35 acres of the temple mount on the east side uh i would probably say that the old city itself is probably one mile that would be fair to say about one mile don't mm-hmm. hold me to it but it's close so the entire temple would fill that whole city but this 50 miles i mean this goes this goes all the way down towards jericho jericho is not even 50 miles away uh, mm-hmm. from jerusalem today and then 50 miles i think if you go from from Jerusalem, uh, people put, maybe somebody could look at this. Put in maybe put in the maps from Jerusalem to Tel Aviv. I think it's only sixty miles. So you, if you're there, you can imagine that it's going all the way. This new city mm-hmm. is almost as big as as wide as what Israel is today. At least central. If you were to go, you know, if you were to go from Jerusalem to Tel Aviv, but obviously it's going to extend to the east towards the Jordan River. Yeah. But it's at least halfway to the Mediterranean and halfway to the Jordan River. That's how big it is. It's tremendously huge. But remember, it's going to be a mountain. Mm-hmm. There's Everything's going to be a plain. All the topography's changes, but the mountain of the Lord is this. Everybody's going to be walking around in all this flat area and go, they're not going to mistake. Mm-hmm. That's the mountain of the Lord. That's where Jesus is reigning. That's where we go. That's where the temple is, etc. So I know I had that question a little bit further down the line, but now since we are, we are talking about this temple, um, and that was one of my questions in the eternal state. So let me just find that real quick. Um, and I noticed, so my friend Mo, um, hey girl, um, she's my crazy friend. So I just noticed her in the comment section. But anyway, when Mo and I talk on the phone, Mondo, she <laughs> comes up with some of her brain is very active. I'll just put it that way because she comes up with some seriously good questions. Like, girl, what, what are you thinking when you're reading the Bible? But it's good, right? It's, it's. I think it's good. It's healthy. So I was just noticing one of her questions that she had asked me a long time ago, and that's why I put it on this outline for me and you. But anyway, I digress. So when this temple, so do you think, and I don't know where it's at. It's somewhere. So do you think that this temple that's coming to Earth? Do you think it's currently in heaven? And let me just say why I don't know that because it's, isn't everything going to be like made new? So where do you think this temple, like, you know, when you said it comes out of heaven. So explain that. Like, is this thing just sitting in heaven right now? Okay. So let me clarify something. Uh, This is different than the temple in eternity. This is not that. So that's called the new Jerusalem in Revelation 21 that comes Mm -hmm. out of heaven. This is not that. 
this is the earthly temple that is just going to exist only during the thousand years, which will be built by the Jews and Jesus uh, for the sake of the thousand years. Then when the thousand years is over, God cleans everything up. He renovates the whole heaven and, and the new heaven, new earth. Then the new Jerusalem, which is in heaven somewhere, comes down out of heaven and comes to the earth. So totally two different situations. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that. That makes sense now in my head. Um, all right. So let's go back to Zechariah 14. So there's some questions in there that I have. Um, so in verse 10, it says no more mountains, a plain, it's flat land. So I think mm -hmm. you kind of just described that um, because I know in pictures that I see currently. So because that's what a plain is, it's flat land. It's like, I don't know, it's a yeah. plain. There's nothing mm -hmm. out there. Um, it's just crazy because when you look at Jerusalem now, I mean, I've heard people like, I think it was John Holler. I think he was on Tom Hughes. And I mean, I'm getting healthy, but for me to walk up, I'm sure I would probably be out of breath hearing that there's hills, right? Oh, no, you're so, in a new body. Well, you keep forgetting that. You're well, no, I'm saying body. current day. If I oh, were to yeah, be yeah. in Israel now, current day, I'd probably like throw up a lung. Um, but anyway, I say that, but you know, I can, I can push myself. So with that being said, you have John Holler. I remember him saying that everything is like, you go up, you go up, you go up. He's like, if you're going down, you know, sooner or later you got to go up. So is it the terrain in Israel is very mountainous in some parts, right? Yeah, right so, now it is. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So then how does it just get flat? I mean, I know it's God. Like I can't well, really, it's God. So uh, the, let me answer a couple things because people are, I see people in the chat talking about the Fruchtenbaum book. Um, if you go to his website, ariel.org, A-R-I-E-L.org, you can get it way cheaper than Amazon. Don't buy it on Amazon. Buy it from his website. You can even get a digital copy for even cheaper. So, because I want people to have, this book is great. The digital and copy. what is the name of it? Because I have this one. That's why I turned around before. Oh. I have this one from him. So that's him. That's his message. Yeah, results. this but is really good. His book is, the book is called Footsteps of the Messiah. And ariel.org, A-R-I-E-L.org, and get it there and get it cheap. Don't buy it at Amazon. It sh should not be 80 bucks by any means. And I think we, we sell it at the Prophecy Watcher. So if you, if you can't find it at Ariel, you can go to prophecywatchers.com. We have it there too um, as well. But okay, so just to help people, I want people to get the, this book is awesome. I'm glad uh, you mentioned that because I know Michael Baker and other people were asking. So thank you for... Yes. So going back to the, the, the plane... It, it, what you do have is in, in it's very mountainous there right now, but in Zechariah 14, it gives us the hint when Jesus puts his foot there again, you have the, automatically this, the mountain moving that like splitting, I mean, like, I don't know, earthquake. I don't know how he does it. Who knows? He just says what he does <laughs> that you get this valley there. So automatically you're having a mention of topographical changes immediately upon Jesus's second coming. But I think that's what the 75 days is for between when he comes back, he's cleaning up the mess uh, 30 days later, he cleans up the temple. And then for the next 45 days, we have the, the, the great white throne judgment. You, you, you see the topography changes. You see the preparation for uh, the introduction of the kingdom. So let me let me bring up another thing, which is interesting, because people talk about the the marriage supper of the lamb that you read about in, Mar in Revelation 19. Well, we know that when we go to heaven at the rapture, that we get married. You know, we're the wife in Revelation 19, the bride and the wife. But you're going to get two different views on does the marriage supper happen in heaven or does it happen on earth? Mm. You no, know, I tend to, so one is that it happens somewhere up in heaven. I don't, I don't think so. I actually think that when we come back down after the second coming, that the marriage supper in celebration, we're already married. Remember, you have the marriage ceremony and then you have the celebration, right? It, it happens later. So in, in ancient times, many times you would have that you'd have the you would have the uh, person get married and then they would celebrate their honeymoon. And, uh, and maybe they, the wedding would be a little more private. And then after a seven day honeymoon, they would go and they would have the, the reception and everybody else was invited and had, everything's been consummated. And look, they're married now. Mm. Um, so in the same way, we're going to go to heaven for seven years. We're going to be married. We're going to have that intimacy with him. John 14, I'm going to receive you to myself. It's going to be awesome mm -hmm. to be with the Lord. And then when we come back down and things are cleaned up, he invites everybody to the, to the banquet. You see this in Matthew chapter eight, uh, the banquet, the banquet, the banquet. I think the banquet is to celebrate Jesus's wedding to us, as well as the kickoff and the inauguration 
for the millennial kingdom to see him rightfully ruled. I mean, it, you have so many things happen at once. You have his coronation. Mm-hmm. You also celebrate his wedding to us, but you have his coronation over the people of Israel. Uh, finally, his 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 own people, his his genetics, right? Mm-hmm. He's, he's he's physically Jewish. They're going to receive him, and he gets honored by them, and they're going to they're going to love him. I mean, I can't wait to see Jewish people in full loving mm-hmm. Jesus. And you know, Zechariah twelve ten says they'll look upon him whom they have pierced, yeah, born like an only son, like they killed their son. I mean, that's how bad it's going to be when they realize what they've done. But also, on the contrary, that's how much love they're going to have for him. Mm-hmm. And so I think that coming after all this topography changed changes during that 75 days, the kickoff is the feast, the the marriage supper and the coronation of our king. I'm glad you brought that up because I was always confused, especially when you read Revelation, where the feast kind of comes into play. And it just never made sense that it was happening while I was in heaven. Yeah, it, it's it's a little awkward. I, I'll, I'll admit it's a little awkward there. It's not quite as tight as I like things, but mm-hmm. um, as airtight as it relates to the to the to the presentation. But with all the rest of the scriptures, um, when he talks about this banquet, it seems mm-hmm. to tie in. The only way it could be fulfilled, it really couldn't be fulfilled in heaven because there's so many other things that are happening that that needs to happen on earth. So let me digress. Do you think we're going to have a bird's eye view of what's happening in the tribulation from heaven? Well, I, I can't give you any verse on it. Yeah. Uh, but we, what we do know is there's a few hints. Uh, for example, in Revelation 8, verse 1, it talks about there was silence in heaven for a half an hour. Mm-hmm. So we're obviously there. Mm-hmm. So, so when God has me in timeout, that's why. Well, <laughs> all of us. I mean, <laughs> if I can stop talking for a half hour, it'd be a miracle. Um, but so, so there's no doubt. And the angels are very busy. So I imagine that not only are we... Um, fellowshipping with the Lord, but we are going to be aware because heaven is aware and that's what we're going to be. Mm. I don't think he's going to keep us oblivious because if you look at the angels, God is recruiting angels. Uh, and for example, there's a, there's a heavenly temple and one of the angels goes and he grabs something from the temple and he throws it to earth. Mm. And so you're like, so they are very active uh, and they're involved. And I imagine that we will be there because you also see, I, I believe we are the 24 uh, elders in Revelation mm. four and five. But if you look at the groups that are there, and I wrote an article, if people want to find an article on our uh, prophecywatchers.com site, go to articles, you'll find my 24 elders there, uh, where I describe all this. But I, I, I go through all of the book of Revelation, and what you see is us rejoicing with the angels, or singing with the angels, or singing with the groups about when a certain judgment happens. We go, hey, righteous and true, and we join in mm-hmm. the, the harps. And so we're, I think we are well aware of what's happening. Yeah, I mean, I've I've always thought that we were because it's hard for us and everything, right, Mondo? And I think you agree with me with this. We see everything through the lens of our human eyes currently, oh, yeah. and we don't know how to really process things outside of that. And we're going to get into some of that um, here tonight. But so I know with me, when I'm thinking of what I am going to be like in heaven, not that I'm I don't have God's mind. Don't get me wrong, but the way we see things is differently. So even though there's judgment on earth, because people here in our flesh are like, oh, I don't want to see all that. But in heaven, it's different because clearly the Bible says, right, his judgments are righteous or true or whatever that says there, right? So we're looking at it from a different point of view. 